using end cuts, making quarter inch wood tile basically, and this is the door from the looking glass. They, they don't they don't have a propensity to crack on the seams on the on the no, grain. That one was that one was locust, and I did it two different ways. One of them I actually went through with wood glue and glued them to a backer, and that worked. But then the second one, I just took construction adhesive, and it, put them on the back, and stuck them on like setting tiles. And that worked out just fine too. Black musk is so dense it yeah. doesn't even absorb water. Yeah. Do you oil that or epoxy it? Or? Um, we put just put a water-based poly on it after it was after it sat. Yeah, yeah, so we, these we doors are also yeah sitting like this, so there's no no water ever hits them. Yeah, the yeah. walls are candid at a 15 degree angle. There's a foot and a half overhang on them over them. This is the bottom step on the live or on the model stringer staircase. Because of the footing underneath of it, there's a concrete slab and a stone footer to hold it up in place. The regular treads weren't going to work. So we found a piece of ash that had just enough character and enough width on it to cover up all that stonework. Again, it's a good use for a small slab. Yeah. Does, that, does that go wide, narrow? Yeah. Oh, no, the string, the staircase? It's no, staircase. it's the same width. Same, same width all the way. way up. That bottom yeah. step's a little wide. It's just a landing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just to cover big, up. We used a bigger piece there um, to help cover those rocks and footers oh, yeah. to keep water away from the base of the staircase because the poplar yeah. is not known for its rock resistance. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder so, where that came from. <laughs> when we, when we Ruby. made that no, mono no. stringer, we flattened it. We took the Alaskan mill and cut a flat face on the top of it to make it easier to work with. This is the waste. As we're wrapping up the job, we've got that, you know, very in, cool. In 12 or 14 foot sections, we have 40 feet of that top cut. And one of the guys sat down and in a couple of hours took that top cut and flipped it and turned it into four or five benches to put around the campfire. And this is all red as deadwood. That's yeah, excellent. So, I mean, it was just, the idea was to, to use it up before we cut it up for firewood. Sure. Um, yeah, so with that, I'll turn it over to Isabella. Yep. Um, I'm Isabella, and I do a lot of the interior design for the three houses. And I just wanted to expand a little bit on uh, the materials that are left over from projects that can actually be really useful with um, completing your space. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with um, botanical pigments, and um, my background is in clothing design, so I actually can experiment with a lot of um, naturally dyed clothing and fabric, um, which is also a great way to incorporate into your interior spaces for upholstery. Um, but something we've been experimenting with a lot is leftover wood material such as um, Osage, like something we have a lot of where we're from. The sawdust, the heartwood, can be used as a natural dye and um, also applied as like a wood stain. Um, here, we'll pass these around. So I have some samples of different trees and plants that have been uh, made into a stain that's a little bit more um, use, like easy to use and less harmful and toxic to whoever's applying it. Um, and it's just a really cool way to use the, you know, the bits and pieces that are left over, um, as opposed to like, you know, buying expensive stains that are really toxic and harmful for your space. Um, the next one. Does it continue to wash out if you use it? You no, know, some of them you you would want to put like a sealer on it. You could do a water-based sealer, or like there's some really great oils like linseed or hemp seed oil. Even that would be great to so, like, seal the pigment into the wood. What are you mixing it with? Nothing. Yeah, so huh. there's so I have an indigo garden that I um, harvest indigo, indigo from and make pigments. So there's one piece of oak, white oak, that has indigo as a stain. And then there's a walnut that actually has blackberries. I know that there are a lot of blackberries in this area, and it, it's so cool and magical because you can literally just like wander around and find so many natural elements that you can use in your interior to dye with and um, incorporate it into your structure. So I wanted to use mulberry, which is another tree 
Um, you can dye with the berries, but it's similar to the blackberry. Um, there's the Osage mixed with indigo, so you can play around with the color pigments and um, get an array of different colors. Um, there's one more, I can't remember what it was. Oh yeah, black walnut. Black walnut is an amazing tree. Um, we use it a lot in our builds. And you can dye with the, the fruit and the walnut husks, um, and they create this gorgeous brown color. Um, What's your medium? Yeah. The medium? Yeah. Like for what I use, the, water. just water. Just you, water? So there's a few I've ways you, you can extract <laughs> 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 He's heard of water. Yeah, you've heard of it. It's pretty amazing because the process is really simple. Um, most of the time, you yeah, can just yeah. basically make a tea. Um, if you were doing a large amount of space, you would just make an even bigger tea, but you can reduce things to um, be more concentrated. But yeah, it's oftentimes just steeping it. Um, all of the ones that I have have only been made into a tea. Um, Is there a product that you can add to your water that would would would, um, would uh, materialize the, the dye and stabilize it inside like the unit? Yeah. Yeah, there, so, you, so moderns... Um, you might have to, this might not be in order, sorry guys. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely share recipes with you. Um, so here, moderants, um, there are a few different ways that help like stabilize the pigments into your wood or your fabric. Um, but a lot of these plants and trees have natural occurring tannins, um, which don't require moderant, so they already will take to the material really well. Um, you can also use moderants to change the chemistry of the colors, so like vinegars or salts, um, alum, iron, like different metals, uh, will completely change like a blue to a, a gorgeous green or like, you know, a, a yellow to like an incredible red. Um, so it's really fun to experiment with, with all of these beautiful organic elements. Um, but yeah, because this is an Osage um, with, you know, you can get completely different colors with different text or different fibers um, and with different uh, moderns. So, but yeah, most of the time the tannins that are, are already in the, um, the plant don't require much. Okay. I mean, you can do things that like thicken it. Um, if you wanted to make inks, oh, that's another thing that's really cool. I have books too, so if you're interested <laughs> pictures in, and books, in, um, <laughs> like flipping through and just kind of getting inspired with what you can do with your interior space, um, you can make all kinds of organic inks. Again, from like the materials that you have left over from your projects. Um, and so let's see, where am I at? Tannin is like an indigo floor. So beautiful, and it is such a concentrated um, plant. You use the leaves, and I just think it's so magical. Um, but you can get a lot of ground covered with this pigment, and it's just. It's can just you go beautiful. back one slide? Yeah. Um, there's a question. Yes. Yeah, so that indigo, is that just also mixed in with water and so applied indigo, directly? The indigo has a few, there's a few processes, you might have to go back. There are a few processes, um, but so I do a fresh leaf indigo dye oftentimes and it's a little bit lighter, but it's instant and it's amazing. And you can see it in the textiles going around the different blues that I've extracted. Um, this one is like making sauerkraut. Have any of you guys made sauerkraut before? Yes. With the salt, and you're rubbing it and your hands get all sore. Um, you can do that with the leaves and salt and you get uh, the pigment just comes straight out and you can incorporate the fabric into that mixture, but then you can also just do the leaves and then have the leftover liquid to paint or dye with. Um, it will be lighter. Uh, the, the way to get a color like this is you would create a fermentation vat. Um, that takes, you know, it just depends on where you are and like how much material, how much leaf material you have. Um, but you basically grow, harvest the leaves, and you ferment them in water um, for a few days. And then you add pickling lime. Um, there's a few other ways to do it with baking soda. I can, I can let you know if, you're, if anyone's interested in learning how to extract pigments, I can expand on that more. Um, and then you can reduce that um, dye vat and create just like an indigo powder by using the sun and basically dehydrating. Uh -huh. 
what you have just created. Um, and then it's reusable. It is, yeah, and it is. And indigo is a pretty, I know it's not a tree, but it, um, it's a part of the buckwheat family and it grows really well. Um, and it, there's a, a, you can, it can grow in many places and is uh, maintainable uh, or manageable. And uh, it has a lot of other great properties when it's in the wood or in the fabric. Um, it, it just like, it helps seal it to a degree, which is pretty awesome for something that's just so simple. Um, and a few others, if you go back up, um, a little bit more, this one. Um, a lot of these plants and trees, um, you know, don't require much to, uh, yeah, to make the wood or the fabric just beautiful and um, useful. And I know that eucalyptus isn't, you know, part of where we are. But those of you who have eucalyptus trees growing, that's an amazing one because it can it can uh, extract an array of color um, with the bark and the leaves. And if you're using it and you're working with it and you've already been like cutting it or whatever, have scraps or branches, um, again, material to be resourceful and use what we already have. Um, Do you turn that? Uh, to wet green lumber compared to dry lumber? For the. Um. You know, I feel like oftentimes when I use things that are a little bit more fresh, the color is a lot more vibrant. Um, but it's just a matter of experimenting, really. Yeah. Um, let's see. Another question. Another question. Yes. How would you get like a really bright chartreuse? Um, so that is a good question. And when you pass these books, I'm giving examples of like how to do that. Page forty-two. But I mean, honestly, a lot of these. And this isn't even like, this is a very small list of what you can get um, pigment from. Like you can get colors from mushrooms, you can get colors from algae. Um, literally, like if you just went around and like picked up pine cones, pine cones make an incredible um, brown and gray. Um, acorns make a gorgeous purple black with the right moderns. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. And you know, we, we spend all of this time um, building these structures and you know we want to kind of like bring it all full circle in order to like be comfortable in the space that we're living in um, or sharing with other people and it's just again like to go on what Jenga was saying it's a cool way to be able to be like oh yeah we stained this wall or we upholstered this couch with you know fabric that we dyed and we used it from our our job site you know or just from the land there's like so much that it offers um, let's see what else do I have? Do we have time? Um, You're good on time. Okay. I also have tons of samples. <laughs> if you guys want to look at like cool textures and ways that you can utilize fabri uh, fibers and fabric. Um, indigo, black walnut. Would you do a tie dye with that? Yeah, you can do tie dyes. You can literally do so much, and I really encourage you to like experiment um, and play around and just like, drop research. One. Thank you. Just research like what's in your um, your region, you know, where you live, and do you want to pass me around? Um, and what you can do with that. Um, it's a, a sustainable way to design things, and it's it's just resourceful and beautiful. And you know, you can. I have from a cookie. This is something that Jacob cut down, and I've been making wood prints with the. The tree cookies, and it's you know from the treehouse that we, you know, built. Sure. And it's just she'll make a pillow out of that, or a few pillows, yeah. and then we'll put that into the treehouse. Oh, yeah, cool. and that's that's, that's the fingerprint of the tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly, and it just adds more character, and it makes the space a lot more special. <laughs> very cool. Um, persons, very yeah, very cool. You can really, just like go crazy with the amount of special things you can do. Cool. Yeah, this is really nice work. Of wild lavender, I encourage you to experiment with it. It'll probably make like a, a light green. And the I sage, bet. sage. Sage is a good one. Nettle is a beautiful one. I know that that's really abundant. Um, yeah, but I would just try making a tea, or you could do an alcohol extraction and probably get some pretty nice greens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, does anyone have any other questions? What, what is this fabric? So that is blue jean and indigo. The fabric? 
Yeah, so the it's actual... been made into a paper, uh -huh. but from blue jean fibers. So, huh. and recycling. So you could make a wallpaper out of that. Exactly, you can make wallpapers. You could make, like this one is encaustic, and it's a very um, ancient waxing process that is almost like vinyl. Okay. Um, and, I mean, it, you can make like a stained glass. I mean, that didn't work. <laughs> 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 Where have I been going with this? You can't do it. You can do it. Hold it up to the sun and you'll be able to see what I mean. But, We're experimenting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I encourage everybody to play. Yeah. We're it, playing along. Don't worry. It's just, it's just a fun process and, and you can do so much with it. So, um, yeah, yeah, I just want to like share and encourage you to... Uh, find more intention behind your your interior spaces and your exterior spaces because we spend so much time in them and it's just a more healthy, um, responsible way to create and design. You really so, just married it all together is what you yeah, did. Yeah, I mean it's a it's an important process and it's a big process so we may as well put a lot of um, intentional energy into it since we put so much work into it from the milling and the harvesting of the wood. It's so, all from the hot and the materials. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. We got one more. I'll be quick. You're good on time, right? No, you're good on time. I'm going to breeze through this. I'm going to sit down too completely. All right. Um, yeah, I'm just going to sit down. What's that? Stand up. No, no, You're right. I don't like those. Hey everybody! Hey, hey man! So my friends here talked about um, ways to use a lot of uh, different aspects of the trees and things from our job sites, and you know we're just trying to close the loop, like Isabella said. So one of the things that's been a passion of mine before I even get started with Canopy Crew is soil microbiology and permaculture design, and um, we got you. These slides are just all kinds of oh, crazy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, so, let me just read my notes. It's common sense for us to take care of our trees before, during, and after working with them. So, I like to think of ways we can improve in this cycle. One of the best proverbs is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, um, that's certainly true with the soil compaction, which is one of the things I've been noticing is like, you know, always a problem on job sites and just existing around trees. Um, so one of the things that we uh, primarily do is mulch, 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 mulch with, um, mulch. Mulch. what's that? Mulch, mulch, mulch. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> and you don't have to just mulch with, in fact, I prefer not to use the stuff that comes in bags from the store. Um, we actually recently got a new shop uh, in Red River Gorge, Kentucky, where we're processing those slabs and doing all kinds of fun stuff. And it actually came with a giant pile of mixed hardwood species decayed wood chips, like matured wood chips, um, that are, I think I'm up to like six or seven species of mushrooms that have popped out of it this summer. So um, that, that, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so to that point, decayed, yeah. you, you used the, the terminology decayed. Um, decomposed. Wood, decomposed. Yes. Because you don't want to put anything fresh. fresh because you don't, it, it'll draw the uh, bugs and stuff to it. You don't it, necessarily right? not want to put anything fresh, but you can upset the soil chemistry by putting a bunch of fresh carbon on and throw things out of whack. Right. So nature's all about balance. Right. She's always trying to find the balance. Right. And so a lot of carbon can lock up nitrogen that would be available. And doesn't it draw the, draw the insects? What's that? Does it? You will not lock up, and there's a lot of research, there's reams of research, so the fresh wood chips yes. incorporated with the volume of soil, you will lock up nitrogen like crazy. Yes. If you just put wood chips down, yes. fresh, raw, undecomposed, it will knock off the nitrogen at the soil interface. It's good for weed control. Yes. But you can, you can put too much. And, so it's, 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 and it's honestly hard sometimes, especially on bigger job sites, to get enough wood chips to be too much. Right. But my point was going to be that, you know, this was the base of a little poplar that we worked in, and we put wood chips down before, but the picture doesn't do it justice. It is like a steep landscape. So, you know, with human traffic, with seven dogs periodically on the job site, <laughs> as well as uh, wind and rain. Um, you know, we put wood chips on before, put wood chips on during, and this was like post-construction, 
And then, and well, actually, you can see these rocks. We're really thankful to have a lot of rocky soil, which helps mitigate compaction. Um, so then, this is after we've done a nice top dressing of that uh, decomposed mixed species wood mulch. And if we wanted to have um, even like that fresher look of wood, like fresh wood chips, we have a local mill that we work with who $20 to give you a dump truck load. Um, but we wanted to have that more. Um, we didn't want a bunch of so, so either or, the, the question that I'm asking is, does it draw insect to the base of the tree on, on that, that aspect? Because I know that, that mulch in, in so that, landscaping design in your rural area yeah. will draw different types of bugs to, to, so to if, it. If you ever come to the Red River Gorge, Kentucky, you're not. I'm coming. The, I'm you're not coming. setting the bug balance up. There's right. bugs everywhere. <laughs> you're not getting rid of them or more of them. Like it's just everywhere That's all a, the time. All right, all right. I, I just don't know what Giant invasiveness bugs. is going to in, in, impact the tree on so, on that. Our, our 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 process here and the in the thinking process is that this is not only mitigating compaction from uh, humans, but also rain. Rain is a big compacting factor. Yep. And what we want to do is cover the soil, because nature abhors bare soil. So if you don't cover it, she's going to. She's usually going to start growing a weed, because it's disturbed soil. So what we've done is covered things up to help retain moisture, to help mitigate erosion and compaction, and then also feed the fungus, because the fungus takes care of the tree. You know, and um, that's primarily what we want to do is feed the fungus. Gotcha. So not only was this an initial dressing, a during, and then after, like post dressing, but we're going to come back and continue to make sure that the soil is always covered with something. And something that we don't have here. If you want to go next slide, um, it's obviously cleared. Let me just get to this. There's a nice Nelson tree house. They've done some nice landscaping here. So something that we're doing right now is in research phase of finding out what the best native uh, herbaceous perennials and you can also that. die with yep. <laughs> plants that we can use plants that are you know um, perennial and compatible and not invasive <laughs> um, we're looking to do some nice landscaping around the trees because you know no tree likes to really no plant really likes to grow alone right so we're gonna uh, work on that aspect of it too and you there's green mulching too so you know the, the more that we can put above the soil the better. Right. Um, <clears throat> does anybody have a question? What if you have like a ton of poison oak? A ton of poison oak? Yeah. Three feet of wood chips. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't, 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 no less. <laughs> it's a little warm there, doesn't it? <laughs> it's not going to hurt the tree? Poison oak? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's that? He's saying that to kill those. <laughs> Okay, well, that's not about the poison oak, right? Yeah. And in three years, I got the best garden. Do you have a question? Can you define treescaping? Can I define it? Uh, Sounds like a pretty broad term. Well, I was just basically having fun with the titles. <laughs> Landscaping around the tree. You know. So, and also I tried to work in as many puns. <laughs> Sometimes it's game mode. There's a lot of like. We, we see it right in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. So, as, along with the uh, you know, feeding the <coughs> ecosystem, I like to think of the soil as like its own organism almost, because organisms are really just collections of multiple organisms. Um, not only do the wood chips and organic matter, which is a broader term I should really be using because it's not just about wood, um, not only do they feed the soil organisms and encourage um, a healthier soil, but the plants do too because plants put out a lot of exudates, especially perennials. They actually have a lot of a vested interest in putting out um, sugars to feed microorganisms to uh, bring them to keep them. a nice, healthy, nutrient cycling ecosystem happening, which is what we want to do with our trees. Because they're dependent on the are they, soil organisms. Are they finding that fern is one of those one of those um, aspects? Well, for, a lot of different ferns grow naturally in our area, right? Because um, we're quite humid, and it's and they're very shade tolerant, and they're perennial, right. and they look lovely. So ferns are usually a good choice to plant under a tree house. Sure, and that keeps people away from underneath the tree house. Yes, yes. If you mulch, if you leave the bare soil, as you pointed out, you get weeds. <clears throat> but if you mulch, you often will get the native plants that are there emerging. Mm -hmm. spreading into it from areas that aren't disturbed. So and, uh, 
Another important thing too is that um, a lot of things in nature are temperature sensitive. So the mulch helps insulate our soil organ organisms and uh, promotes the, the growth of um, the natives that are already there and the incubation of seeds that are already there. Um, the floor is off. See, we're having fun with the slides. Yes, we are. Something we have to move to is in the case of the bugs. We have to change our look on all of it because uh, the bugs bring another animals. So we yes. increase the value of the soil because another animals bring another microorganisms. So yep. uh, it becomes more complex. Yeah. yeah. If anybody knows Paul Samets, have ever heard of him? He did a he did a great a um, experiment where they decomposed uh, like basically oil spill waste with oyster mushrooms and mushrooms are vanguard species so the mushrooms decomposed the oil which is normal, just toxic normally mm -hmm. the mushrooms grew they were very happy mushrooms and then the mushrooms brought bugs the bugs brought birds the birds brought yeah. seeds you had soil from the mushrooms and then basically that big stinky pile turned into a berm of green light and thinking about the business to uh, increase the value of the area because when someone comes to the woods, mm -hmm. he wants to see nature. Right. Yeah. And more, more nature you have, more nature you have. Mm -hmm. more nature. Yeah, and it's very easy with construction sites, especially when you've got like schedule and production, start trampling things. So that's why I was going back into the ounce of permissions where they found a cure. And it's, you know, we can go back and plant things and cover things up, but a lot of times it's better. You can go for it. Uh, to just not do damage in the first place. So one thing that we could always do better on is scaffolding and you know sometimes you just want to get in there and get started on something but it's a lot better for compaction reasons and usually safer and easier to work on to um, throw up scaffolding whether it's in the form of like traditional metal scaffolding like over there which you can rent yeah. very effectively and cheaply or you can just build some stuff out of two by fours and then chicken ramps does anybody know what a chicken ramp is? Board with slats on it. So if you've got any kind of grade, um, those are great things to tack down. Because even though you might think of like human's footprint not being very heavy, a lot of it over time does a lot of damage and that compaction just drives deeper. Uh, temporary stairs, another thing where it's like, you know, instead of uh, traveling the same route all the time, you can build like a set of stringers and just build them on site. And then when you're done with them, take them apart take them back to the shop, store them behind the garage, and then use them on the next job. That's it. This one of the has to touch button on the, the landscape is the ground, grounding trees. Yes. And a technique that I have used where if you're fighting a structure, in, in most cases something that's on the ground and supporting a tree house uh, nearby, mm -hmm. I will literally dig and temporarily mend into adjacent soil the plants that are on the footprint of the building mm -hmm. and then build the structure and then replant those very plants into a living root on that structure to just reestablish the same mix of species that was on that footprint mm -hmm. at the roof level huh. and it, it's I'm going to call that the Jefferson technique. Huh? That's the Jefferson technique. It's moving on up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got here? Uh, here we go. So, this is the paper table. And the picture again doesn't paint it justice, but it's a very steep hillside. And a lot of times, a white folding table will not stay put. So, um,. I just take a, a GRK with a 5 16 lag screw and tack it to a, um, a tree that we're not actually building, not a critical tree, and fill a simple knee brace with a little table on it. And uh, you know, this is where we're getting ready to put in some tabs. So it's like basically the tab kit. And just another way to like organize. Work on the space with what we have. And that's like material that we move from job site to job site to job site. So it's in the essence of <coughs> repurposing. Recycling. Um, this is one of the things that we do. Just a filler slide. Next one. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so this is something I'm like tangent segueing into, um, in an effort to not to mitigate that compaction and our disturbance on the site. You know, after we have recycled the wood chips and everything, um, this is something I've been really passionate about. So I just wanted to blab about is rigging. So we're trying to get off the ground. Um, heavy equipment. Uh, is great because it can really speed things up, make you more productive. You can prefab things, but in our situation, we can't really bring things in. It's just not logistical 
logistically possible. So rigging is a way for us to get things, you know, onto the site without even touching the ground right. and disturbing things. So this is, uh, if anybody's familiar with BMM, they've come up